And I went to my first General Assembly, and here I was that particular year, that was 93, and it happened to also be Charlotte, North Carolina, was my first General Assembly. And I say to people, if I survived Charlotte, you know I really wanted to be the <laughs> Seriously, seriously. Um, and so, here I was sitting in the plenary, and this particular year they were depicting Unitarian Universalist history um, with these historic personalities and figures. And so I saw various individuals that I had read about and I was excited and it's like, yes, I, I okay, I, I, I remember Channing, yeah, I remember um, Jose Babu. Um, I remember, um, and then these um, various individuals, and then it was over. Right. And it's like, oh, well, where, where are those people that Mark Morris and me talk about in Black Pioneers? Where, where is Francis on the line of Harvard? And it's like, I remember thinking, oh my goodness, what have I got myself into? <laughs> and what I had got myself into was the recognition that I needed to do the work. I needed to do the work, and I will give um, props to Dorothy May Emerson, because she had started uh, standing before us. If you have not read this anthology, it's a collection of, of essays about um, um, famous Unitarian and Universalist women um, who have um, pioneered um, and really made incredible contributions. And she invited me to, um, to submit an essay on Francis Ellen Watkins Harper, and that began my sojourn um, and my pursuit uh, of Francis Ellen Watkins Harper. And then the um, Unitarian Universalist Women's um, Federation, um, each year they would honor um, the best sermon on a um, Unitarian Universalist woman. And I wrote a particular sermon that particular year and was um, honored. And eventually they got to a point where they gathered all of those sermons into a collection, uh, an anthology. And so all of those sermons are now listed. So we have still more publications so I, 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 I give thanks to those whose shoulders I stand on, to those who lent me a helping hand and guided me along the way and, and said, have you thought about this, have you looked at this, so on and so forth. Okay, so we're gonna move on now to the collage. And um, I, without much introduction, this was just my attempt to say, you know what, this is what I see from my lens in the world of Unitarian Universalism, and it's peopled with UUs of color. Um, because I'm intentional about nurturing those relationships and those communities, and I just want you to be able to see some of these faces um, and some of the context in which we gather. And so I'll say a few things um, as we, in fact, move along. So what I recognize is that we have diversity across the generations. On my left, um, this is um, the Reverend Dr. Michelle Bentley, um, and she is among the first four black women clergy that were ordained in our um, Unitarian Universalist denomination and movement. She also was the founder and director of Sankofa Archives. Sitting in the um, wheelchair, is Dr. Jim Brown. Jim has, the, he's retired now, but he has the distinction and honor of having been the first, dis, the first black district executive in our uh, Unitarian Universalist Association. I came along in, 19, in 2000 um, as the first female and the second black district executive. Um, and then just to contrast, the, the, the generations and the ages, these are two young adults at the General Assembly, and they are staffing the table of both Sankofa, um, Luna's table, Latin America, uh, Latin American, uh, Latino and Latino 
Unitarian Universalist uh, Network. Um, and so again, I'm uh, attempting to depict some of the, the some of the age diversity um, within our movement. We also have diversity among women of color. On my left, just looking at these beautiful smiling faces, I see Pacific um, Islanders, I see Latinas, I, uh, I see uh, Black and African American. And one of the reasons you'll hear me mostly say black rather than African-American. When I was in New York doing this research, um, Janice Johnson, who is, um, she is now the um, director of multicultural, um, hmm, it, it has to do with um, working with um, people of color and with our congregations. And she said, well, aren't you going to include us? Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking, Mm -mm. What did I miss here? She's Jamaican. <laughs> Jamaican women, Jamaicans period, do not refer to themselves as African American. And so when we use that term, we're excluding them. When we use the term black, we are including them because they consider themselves black. Now another term that you can use that will then be inclusive is um, of African descent. They recognize themselves as part of the diaspora, and um, um, at being of African descent, but they are not technically African American and do not use that term. So that was so helpful for me. I've been trying to go through my material and um, correct the language, so I'm passing that on to you. It's not a big deal, and yet it is, you know, and yet it is, and she was gracious enough to, um, to educate me so that I would have that awareness and understanding. We have Native American um, Unitarian Universalists um, that are represented in this picture of women, women of color. We have bi biracial women. I see a couple of, um, um, at least one Palestinian Unitarian Universalist um, and Iraq, Iraqi. I am still trying to find out how many black female clergy we actually have. In other words, what percentage um, we make up. This is on my right, Joyce Parks, who is Reverend Joyce Parks. Um, I think I got that name right. Palmer, thank you, Palmer. And this is Lauren Spencer on my left in the middle. Um, and they were processing at General Assembly. In other words, they had formally been recognized um, as, um, as ministers. What I am noticing, in, in, and I, so I've been at UU since um, 92, so I've had time to now start to um, do some research and also just some anecdotal reflections. And what I'm noticing is that there are a higher percentage of interracial marriages within Unitarian Universalism, and what I recognize is that there is the safety that is, um, is that it is an important um, dynamic for interracial couples. And for that reason, they recognize that as Unitarian Universalists, we honor the inherent worth and dignity of individuals, regardless to what the race, regardless to what the theology, so on and so forth. And so, understanding that, this is um, Betty Bobo Seiden, on the right, and her husband, I believe his name is Richard, I know her better than I know him. Um, but I lift them up here as a recognition of individuals who come to us because they recognize the safety, um, and they also recognize that our theology, our ideology, our beliefs, our principles say that we value you for who you are, not the color of your skin, not, you know, so on and so forth. There is also what we're beginning to see, more diversity within our um, religious education programs than actually in our pews, if you will, um, because many UUs are adopting biracial children or adopting outside of their races, and so, if we ever think we have the luxury of not struggling with the issue of diversity, with the issue of um, multiculturalism, 
we must take a walk into our religious education classroom and be reminded, be reminded that we don't have the luxury of not struggling with these issues because they are raising these issues um, by their very presence and as they grow older they raise the issues um, in, a, in a very forthright manner and they want, they want answers and they want to know and I want I want to know that I struggled with integrity rather than um, um, acting complicitly and not addressing the issues. I want the legacy I want to leave is that yes, I I, I stepped out there into the fray, um, not necessarily with any more knowledge than anyone else, but with the belief that together we can figure this out. Right. Ministers of color are also represented among the GLBTQ community in Unitarian Universalism. Um, these ministers are all out, so I'm not outing anyone. This is Reverend Chester McCall on the left. This is Reverend Marta Valentine, um, African American, uh, Latina, uh, Latina, and this is Carlton Smith, um, African American, on my immediate right. These, these pictures were taken with their permission at one of our um, um, UUs of color. Our professional religious, um, religious professionals get together on an annual basis, and I'll talk a little bit more about that later, but this was one of those um, annual events. Matter of fact, my coming in from uh, DC this morning, I was coming from this year's annual retreat. And, and this is um, where I wanted to begin to talk a little bit about that. So you use some color retreat annually, and it has been designated um, earlier for clergy and directors of religious education, and we began to realize we wanted to include directors of music and administrators of color. So why do we need to get together? Um, one of the reasons is that we are so few in number. Later on when I get to my next um, presentation, I actually have some statistics that you can see. But we are so few in number. Um, many of our congregations, um, people of color, are fortunate because if not a critical mass, there are at least more than one or two. When there's one or two, there's a sense of isolation. There's a sense of they have to be the one. They have to be the teacher and the educator. Everybody wants them on every committee. Um, it is just, it's just not possible. Um, one of the things that I love about the um, encouragement and the notion of allies is that that breaks some of that isolation. It breaks the notion that somehow or another people of color have to be the educators and do all of the teaching. And allies get it around that. And so they work very hard to do some of that education and teaching, recognizing that it's not, it's not appropriate or fair to place that burden on, on, on you use of color. I have no idea what that is. This week. That's not my, my phone doesn't sound like that. So. Um, I love this age diversity over here. This is Joseph Santos Lyons' um, youngest daughter, who is now a little older than that. And this is Carlton Smith holding her at one of the annual retreats a few, a few years ago. Um, but I, he just, I tease him, he, just, they're both adorable in this picture. And it reminds me of the age diversity um, within our movement and within um, movies of color. This is a picture from one of our annual retreats as well, and it captures um, 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 women of color here. In this instance, we have two ministers and two lay persons. To my immediate left is the Reverend Dr. Monica Cumming. Um, and then this is Vanessa, and I don't remember Vanessa's name, but um, Vanessa is um, with the Restoration Church in Tulsa, and if you all know any of the history in terms of um, in terms of Tulsa, um, she is the administrator with uh, Gerald Davis, who is the minister at uh, Restoration. 
This is Taquina Boston in the center. Taquina is the director of um, Multicultural Ministries. I think they have a new name for it. And this could either be Hope Johnson, who is uh, the Reverend Hope Johnson, or it could be her identical twin, who is Janice. It's Janice. Uh, more power to you. I have yet to figure out how to. I used to do it by the clothing because they do not dress identically. But um, um, <laughs> um, again, I just I this picture I just really captures the um, the diversity within um, women of color within our Unitarian Universalist movement. And here, who is this person on the left? Does he know in the least? This is our Unitarian Universalist Association president, Peter Morales, and um, Peter is a uh, is a Latina, a Latino. Um, I, when I'm really being PC, I all I, I say um, people of color and Latino, Latina, because not all Latinos and Latinas identify as persons of color. That they 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 are. How can I say this? Um, the, the, the term for them has a political connotation that they don't necessarily agree with, and so we out of that by trying to include people of color and Latinos, Latinas. Um, but here he is at one of our annual retreats. So he attends, and he was here this weekend, as both our president and also as a, as, as a Latino man, uh, as a Latino UU man, um, um, that is a part of our movement and denomination. This was a group picture we took at the uh, UU's of Color and, and Latino and Latina annual retreat in 2010. Um, this is the Dr. Mark Hicks, and he was previously at George Mason um, University and is now um, faculty at um, Mida Lombard Theological School. And one of the things that I know is that people of color and Latinas and Latinos are, um, are um, represented in all levels of Unitarian Universalism um, in our congregations and in institutions um, outside of our faith communities. Um, some of the work that we're doing at, um, at Meadville, for instance, we have been intentional about really looking at the issue of, um, of diversity and how to infuse um, multiculturalism, boundary crossing, et cetera, into our curricula so that we are preparing our ministers um, as they come out into move into settlement and are bringing those um, innovative ideas and the understanding about what it means to be border crossers, what it means to be um, multiracial, multicultural, and anti-oppressive. Um, this is just, again, another example. These are first-year students that are in a community setting. Part of what we recognize is that rather than waiting until the third year to put them in an internship setting, put them in a um, some kind of teach, learning teaching setting, is we are from the very beginning placing them in community settings where they're oftentimes with people that are different than they are. In this particular um, class, I think that there was one, maybe two, um, persons of color that identified as persons of color, Latino, Latino, um, and the the um, total number of admissions in this particular class was about 30, 31, 32. So you see what the ratio is, and we have to be very intentional, otherwise it would be so easy for our students to move through a curricula with no acknowledgement that there is diversity in the world, whether you see it or not, in our, in, 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 in our congregations. And if we are going to be intentional about um, nurturing that diversity, then to be exposed to it in ways that you begin to believe that it's, it's, the, it's supposed to be the norm, 
We're supposed to be together in all of our diversity, so on and so forth. So these are some of our efforts um, in order to do that with, with our seminarians. This is, again, another community setting on the left. These are two staff people in Chicago at a program called Living Room Cafe. It's a program designed for homeless individuals. Um, one is the director of their housing program and the other on the left side um, um, Cesare is a um, former addict, um, former homeless individual who now is on staff and works with the uh, homeless um, um, residents. We have a student place with them um, currently. This picture on the right, the reason I inserted this, this is a community program that allowed us to use their um, computer lab. We all know how important it is to build partnerships. Mm -hmm. Those partnerships allow us to share and exchange resources. They allow us to use their computer lab um, at no cost whatsoever simply because we work in partnership with one another. We have a relationship with one another. They recognize the value of our mission and we recognize the value of what they were doing in the community. Um, this is just an example um, where we brought in um, some individuals. These are professional um, actors, and they did a reading of um, August Wilson's Gem of the Ocean, and it was just absolutely incredible. And we talked about the use of the arts in ministry um, and some of the themes of Gem of the Ocean. This, these are pictures from um, General Assembly 2010, and this picture on the left is actually, Kent, what is um, you, um, UU Congregation of Atlanta's minister's name we were talking about him? Anthony Davis. Anthony Davis. This is Anthony Davis on the left with a um, member. This is Marvin Lavalar in the middle who is the senior minister at All Souls Tulsa, and I've forgotten these individuals, but they all represent kind of UU congregations that are doing outstanding um, work around diversity, and they were talking about some best practices. Um, and this is just another picture of, um, of the two of them over here. I, I get, a, get the opportunity to travel around a lot, and so one of our alums um, was the minister down in Augusta, and I went to visit her back in um, December. And the, the woman on the left um, in the sort of pink shirt has been a member at Union Church of Augusta for about 20 years. She is one of maybe three or four black members. They, I think they have one other Latina woman in the congregation. And um, I got ready to say my friend's name, and my, my, I, I know you, where's Tim? I, I can't see you. Oh, you can't, okay. She, um, she used to be, um, <laughs> okay, I'll come again, and I can't be at this age or what. <laughs> People's Church in uh, Chicago, Illinois, is an interesting congregation. They are both UCC and UU. Um, and these two women have been there for 20 plus years. And I'm, um, when I found that out, I'm taking their contact information and talking with them and that, and that kind of thing. This picture here, I've probably done more work at First Unitarian Church in um, Chicago than any place else because number one, it's my home congregation, and number two, on our roles, we have 30 plus black women in, uh, uh, at First Unitarian. Yeah, it's, we have a critical mass there. Um, and so they were interested in my research, and I was interested um, in talking with them. And so we had some meetings that we convened, and then we said, why don't we convene with the black women at Third Unitarian Church, and why don't we convene with the women over at, um, uh, at uh, People's? And also, and so we in fact did that. And it was sort of a historic moment because some of them knew each other, but they almost never ever met. 
They almost never ever talked, but they were all in the same city. And so the opportunity to just um, come together um, in community and fellowship and just give thanks for um, the wonderful things that are going on in community and the things that we need to continue to work on was part of that conversation. And this is a, um, I say to people, the reason I became Unitarian Universalist was because of the social justice orientation. I was involved, active, active in the community around social justice. And so it's like I had heard about the Unitarian Universalists. Let me go and check out these folks. And the reason I stayed Unitarian Universalist is because of the theological diversity. Being able to really grow my understanding about theology and who I am as a spiritual human being. But this picture, I love. You can't see it, but I'll read it. The one at the top, it says, in solidarity with our Muslim brothers and sisters. And First Unitarian Church is on the set on the corner of 57 and South Woodlawn. And it has some, some um, vehicular traffic, and it has a lot of pedestrians. And so he's holding this sign up facing pedestrians and the cars and so on and so forth. And in front and around him are covered Muslim, five Muslim women that came that particular day to speak to us and talk about their struggles and what was going on. And this picture really depicts for me and symbolizes for me who we say we are as a people of faith. That uh, after 9-11, um, um, many of our ministers didn't have to go to information or go to um, the Rolodex. They had the email on speed dial because they already had relationships with them. It wasn't about, well, let me see who the local email is. Our UU ministers knew who they were. And this is important because it's an extension of what we believe. And that is that interfaith dialogue is absolutely necessary. How many of you know what drum stands for? Okay, that's good, that's good. Diverse and revolutionary, Unitarian Universalist Multicultural Ministries. Now I know why we say drum. <laughs> Um, so these, these are UUs of color who come together for community, come together to share and exchange resources. And so we come together in various venues, but I've already named one, the annual retreat. But GA is very important. We put on a lot of um, um, workshops and programs. This is us gathering before we do uh, we do worship for ourselves. We need to feed our souls so that we can feed others, so that we can um, do the work that we are called to do. And so here we are gathering at the GA 2011 as we're preparing for our own worship. This is just um, another picture. I just went around the room capturing pictures of, uh, of individuals who were um, present. <laughs> Existence of diversity fosters, if not more diversity, then at least continued diversity and increased understanding. So this picture on the left is Hall Chapel at First Unitarian Church. These are our seminarians, and this is Mark Hicks again. In a teaching moment with them, they've broken into small groups and they are talking about some um, issues pertinent to ministerial formation. Now this picture is a historic picture on the right because this is Meadville faculty and Andover Newton faculty. How many of you know that um, we have created a partnership um, between the, these two institutions and in the summer of this year, we are going to uh, roll out an interreligious university. We are also in conversation with Hebrew College. Um, they are very interested and, and are proceeding and rightfully so slowly to make sure that this is a fit for them. But again, not only is this an extension of our entrepreneurial spirit that many seminarians are um, um, declining um, in this economic um, disastrous period, 
And we also still have to be creative and in integrity with ourselves. We cannot sit around and wring our hands and woe is us. So the creative energies and imagination said, let's come together and create something stronger and better than anything we could do individually. And so the three individuals on the, on the sofa are three of our, our faculty from Media Lombard. Um, that's our pro provost in the center chair while she was standing. And then the two individuals on each side of her are faculty from um, Andover and Newton. I must say we had a love fest. We fell in love with each other. So it's like, okay, so the faculty is on board. So administration and the rest of the, and the boards of the two institutions need to, need to make this happen because we're, we're on board with it. So um, we're moving along and we sold all of our property and we would use the, um, the assets, um, the revenues from the sale of those properties to then enter into a long-term lease where we have more space and can accommodate our, our students and, and so on and so forth. Um, I recently had an opportunity to preach at the Olympia Brown congregation in Racine. Um, Illinois, Wisconsin. Wisconsin, thank you. Yeah. I Utah, I'm not for that. And um, I was told, look down here at this pulpit, this is Olympia Brown's pulpit. So I, I was told that I'm the first black female clergy to speak from her pulpit. So of course I had to capture a picture of that. That was a historic moment. Um, and I just captured some pictures outside of the Olympia Brown um, UU congregation. Can you talk about Olympia? For the public? <laughs> what can I say about her? Um, here's my brain again. 18. I have the date up here. We'll get to it. But she was the first woman that was ordained um, in this in this country. Um, now. I have run across some information recently that says that there's a Congregationalist woman that was uh, ordained before her. Um, and I'm, I'm doing some research on that. We, we can, you know what, we can, we can share the, um, the glory of that moment. Um, we're, all, we're big enough. The Methodist claim one, too. Oh. <laughs> she just said the Methodist, Methodist also claim one. But it's, it's very important to, to, to do this research and to have accurate information. Um, these are some of our uh, youth of color, and I captured this picture because I was taking some pictures that day, and they knew what kind of research I was doing, and they said, look, don't forget about us. <laughs> and so that's what this picture symbolizes, don't forget about us. <laughs> so for all the work we do, my reality is that I oftentimes go into settings where I am still the only black clergy. Uh, and this it was a, um, an ordination last year that took place in the Chicago area. And I captured a picture. All of the ministers are represented except for me here. Um, and I, this sort of symbolizes that isolation and the need that we, that we, we need to remind ourselves that we can't stop where we are. We need to continue to grow and develop and, and, and understand why um, diversity is so important. Um, we want people to be able to see themselves when they come through the doors. We want them to say, hmm, they're doing their work here. Or it looks like they're at work here and I want to join, I want to join them in their work. Um, links to the past, present, and future assure of, assure of of a proud legacy, and I've just captured some pictures here. This is Fanny Barrier Williams, a, a black Unitarian woman who was part of um, All Souls, the same All Souls that exist this, that, to this day, and it's like only a hand, they must have maybe 10 or 15 active members at All Souls in Chicago. Mm -hmm. um, and she was a member when Jean and Lloyd Jones was the minister um, at, at uh, All Souls. And so we, you know, we, we don't know this stuff if we aren't doing the research. And I really just have a commitment to do this because I love um, learning about and knowing um, these are in fact the shoulders that I stand on and that we've been here longer than we, meaning people of color,
Chicano and Latinos and Latinos have been here longer than we actually realize. Um, Mark Morrison Reed likes to say, actually we've been here since the beginning of Unitarianism and Universalism in this country. You know, now we can't claim that in terms of Transylvania, but we can claim that. We can claim that in, in terms of Unitarianism and Universalism in this country. And he does more than claim it, he documents it. Okay. So where are we? Well, I think we have more visibility and awareness about the issues and about the presence of UUs of color, Latina and Latinos. We have more published authors. I remember distinctly in 2007, Skinner Press proudly announcing its 14 authors. And when I got it and looked at it, I went through every single one and I thought, oh my goodness, in 2006, there's not a single author of color on this list. I don't know what happened in the interim besides, I know I was like really knocking on their door and pushing and so were some others. There is literally, uh, can you call it a renaissance if you haven't had the um, <laughs> flourishing, but it literally is a renaissance at this point. Mark, first of all, Mark Morrison Reed has retired. He has become so prolific, I'm just embarrassed. He's like churning out books. He, he has two more that he is uh, currently um, 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 working on, and then he has one, um, it's an anthology of essays on uh, UUs of color that will come out um, this year. Um, I know you've seen Arc of the Universe is long, and it's big. It, it, I predict it will become the definitive historical document in terms of the history of, of, of UU's anti-racist um, and multicultural and diversity efforts in our movement and denomination. The meticulous research that they've done, they have interviews in there, they have documents in there, they cover critical social um, movements and historical periods um, um, that really defined who we were around these issues. Um, it's, a, it's a powerful book, and I encourage y'all to think about using it um, as a study tool. Um, it, it just, it's, I'm, I'm so impressed with what they did. It would take me forever to name some of the other um, resources that are available. Coming from the retreat, um, I learned about some more that are, um, that are in progress. And so that has changed significantly in terms of um, some um, published authors of color. Also at the retreat for the first time, we've brought up um, scholars of color over the last three years, but this year, not only did we have a critical number, but we actually moved along in terms of um, some um, action steps that we want to engage in. So you say, well, you know, what's, what's the significance in terms of scholars of color? First of all, we did this ritual where um, Sophia Bettencourt um, gathered some of the um, written materials that uh, you use of color had um, published, produced, and we laid them on the altar, and we called their names, and people were amazed at how much has been published how much scholarship has been generated. But guess what? We weren't even paying attention. We were in our own little isolated worlds doing our thing, so we didn't even realize that we really have generated a body of knowledge that we didn't even, didn't fully comprehend. So just the beginning efforts to say, look, here's a listing of as far back as we can identify scholarship, and, and we name scholarship very broadly, everything from sermons to spoken word um, to scholarly, highbrow, intellectual research um, to children's stories, um, curricula, all of that we consider scholarship. And so um, there's some more awareness around it. Also, white allies are more visible um, more numerous and more outspoken. So instead of that person of color having to 
interrupt some situations, some incidents, some comment, insensitive comment that was made, this ally can step in and do that and be in solidarity with that person of color, that Latino, Latino, so that the burden doesn't always fall on that individual. Because that's what adds to the isolation. You have to be the one, the only one all the time. It is burdensome, folks, believe me. Also, there are more fiscal and human resources that are available both from the UUA and as our congregations begin to realize the need for certain kinds of, um, whether it's covenant groups and we need resources for that or whatever it is, but I, I'm seeing more of that. I also am seeing that the resistance is subsiding. Now I had written this initially and then while I was at the retreat this weekend and in a session, a writing session, the um, facilitator had us to do a, 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 an exercise where we describe a time we felt um, um, not included and excluded. And then after that, we describe a time we felt included. And I was so appalled at some of the things that I heard in terms of feeling excluded that I wound up adding this little, or is it? Is it really subsiding? Um, I have to believe that it is, and I have to believe as, as um, people of goodwill and faith um, that the vision that we have um, for holding up the, the inherent worth and value of individuals is so much a part of our DNA as a movement and denomination, as a people of faith, that regardless to the appearance of circumstances, that we know that our intentions and our actions are such that we continue to do that and we continue to push forward and we continue to make mistakes and learn from those and continue and continue. Um, we cannot give up. We cannot acquiesce. Otherwise, we're no different than the larger society. And so I believe that um, we're here to make a difference around that. Okay, so this is my really, really basic teaser, y'all. So we're getting ready to really get down to business now and, and, and do some work. So um, give me a minute, y'all can stretch or do whatever you need to do so that I can uh, transition. <laughs>